Buonasera a tutti. Benvenuti a So good um, afternoon and welcome to this meeting entitled uh, the 20 year old who said the infinite why does man who is a finite creature longs for the infinite this question was uh, posed to us on the 18th of March 2018 by a Muslim student Uh, in front of a uh, hundred of students who attend courses at the Department of Italian at the Helvan University in Cairo, Egypt. And this at the end of a conference organized by the Claudi Foundation that I chair and the Centro Studi Marche with the collaboration of the Italian Cultural Institute at Cairo. Head, headed by, uh, chaired by Mr. Paolo Sabatini, and this within uh, the framework of a literary event entitled Italy uh, Culture Mediterranean, uh, the Mediterranean Infinite. Uh, basically, they wanted to spread uh, the content of the infinite in Cairo, and I was invited, David Ronvoni was with me, we were both invited, and we participated within these initiatives that we promoted under uh, the project called Infinite 200. The project was conceived by Davide on the occasion of the writing of the drafting of the poem uh, Infinito, the Infinite, on uh, the part of uh, by, by Giacomo Leopardi that we are going to talk about today. The question I was reading out before is very simple. Why is man, why does man, who is a finite, limited creature, longs for the infinite, wants the, wants the infinite? Actually, this question uh, revealed two things to me. The first thing was that knowing uh, uh, what we, what man is made of and what we are made of is not to be taken for granted today. It cannot be taken for granted. It's quite the opposite. I would dare to say that this should be the first insight for a proper educational and cultural kind of work. So cultural work, whatever cultural work one wants to carry out. If, of course, one wants to carry out this kind of cultural work, uh, because looking around us, one can truly say that those who carry out uh, uh, truly cultural work uh, are less and less. Lots of initiatives are carried out, but uh, if you analyze them in detail, the initiatives which really make you think who man is, what man is, and what his destiny are increasingly limited in number. And yet, this unknown, this question is the very same question that induced Leopardi in the nocturnal chant, this experience uh, characterized by the imbalance between uh, uh, what makes us. Uh, so human nature is weak, and yet it feels everything else. Natura umana, or come se frale in tutte ville, se polve e tombra sei, tutt'altro senti. So the Claudi Foundation would like to carry out uh, an investigation to try and answer, to try and face the challenge of this educational work, which is based on the awareness that the life of man is not defined by its limitation, but rather uh, towards its uh, eagerness, uh, its longing for happiness, uh, or at least its desire to reach what is really worth living, uh, not as an ephemeral dream, but rather as the affirmation of the fact that there's something else uh, that uh, in a way, uh, brings this into being, brings this desire into being. The Claudi Foundation wants uh, to uh, focus on this because uh, uh, actually this is uh, the, the, the poetry of Leopardi is characterized by a number of emblems, of symbols, for example, spaces or the emblematic presence of the star as a sign of hope. The second thing that induces us to pose ourselves the question uh, is exactly, uh, refers exactly to the importance of uh, Leopardi's poetry today. 
and therefore the fact that it is important to pay attention to this event to the 200 years of, from the drafting of the infinite of Leopardi. So together with Davide, Davide Rondoni, we defined this project, the project Infinite 200 in collaboration with the Center for Contemporary Poetry of the University of Bologna, with the Centro Studi Marche, the Marche Study Center, and also institutionally with the official celebrations that will start in 2019 under the auspices of the National Center on Studies uh, on uh, um, Giacomo Leopardi from Recanati, whose president is Fabio Corvatta. It is really peculiar that the first uh, step of this uh, series of events took place in Cairo because uh, it sort of tells us that you sort of uh, try and bring together two cultures that are so diverse one from the other irrespective of where man is in the sign and in the name of the infinite and it is also very peculiar that the day before on the 17th of March the infinite poem was read out on the Mokattam Hill before the community of the Zabalin Copts, and there were about 70,000 uh, people. Uh, the Zabalin Copts are the ones who uh, are, so to say, garbage collectors, and there were more than 70,000 people. Then there were other public events, uh, the 12th of April in Rome, and then the 29th of March in Stuttgart in Germany. And yet the idea behind this project was to rather think of a celebration characterized by several steps with lots of players, lots of subjects, both in Italy and abroad. So we uh, talked about a series of events uh, um, with people that want to celebrate this poetry. Uh, an open celebration, uh, a bottom-up celebration, and we act as uh, the elements that bring all the various subjects together. So a lot of events will take place, readings, studies, music, and every day the list goes on and becomes longer because it is characterized by a number of initiatives uh, uh, taking place in several cultural centers uh, in several uh, and organized by several associations in Italy and abroad. So, um, this is a celebration that, and everybody can contribute. Before leaving the floor to Davide Riondo, Rondoni, pardon, I would like to remind two other initiatives that the Claudi Foundation is organizing in the second half of 2018. The first one is the sixth edition of uh, the Piccolo Festival dell'Essenziale, the small essential festival traditionally uh, held in Rome, which, however, this year is going to take place in Milan on the 14th and 15th of uh, uh, September in the Rosetum Cultural Center in Milan. Every year we choose five words, and the words that we chose this year for the Milan edition uh, are, have been proposed uh, to focus on the essential in our contemporary times, and they are birth, strength, surprise, and always. The festival is promoted with the Association Amici di Marzo, the Tempi magazine, the Esserci Association, and Altamento Factory. And this um, event uh, uh, features a number of artists, conversations, even uh, a fashion catwalk on Dante. Uh, maybe Davide will tell us a little bit more on this. This will take place on the occasion of the fashion week. Uh, actually, a week before the fashion week in Milan. And actually, at least uh, we have we sort of uh, want to raise the bar well before the fashion week starts. So the deputy prime minister Matteo Salvini in accepted our invitation to have a conversation on the issues related to the rebirth of our country. There will also be other participants: the songwriter Alma Pedrini, then Filippo Laporta, um, literature uh, critique. Then the art historian Beatrice Buscaroli, Italian philosophers like Giovanni Maddalena, Alessandro Pertosa, Stefano Di Bella, Giuseppe Pintus, and many, many others. Uh, the program is very rich, and it will soon be published online on the website of uh, our festival. The other initiative is a cultural exchange at the Claudi um, foundation organizes between the universities of Macerata, Urbino, and the Tula University, which is the hometown, which was host, hometown to Tolstoy. 
workshops will be organized both here in Italy and in Russia and on two important uh, writers, Tolstoy and Claudio Cladi. I will personally go to Tula. I will bring uh, students, a PhD student, Gabriele Codoni, and three students from the University of Urbino and Macerata from the 1st first, first to the 5th of uh, November. While the Russian students uh, with their professors will come to Rome and in the market from the 27th of September uh, to the 2nd of October. These in initiatives are framed within the uh, more articulated uh, program organized by the uh, Claudio Foundation um, in Palazzo Claudi on the occasion of the Summer Festival. Um, also, besides the International Poetry Award called Le Stanze del Tempo, that uh, also has an open uh, call for poems, so to say. So, if you still have time, you're still invited, you're kindly invited to submit your poems. And then uh, there are exhibitions in Palazzo Claudi in Serra Petrona. And also visit the website Fondazione Claudi, besides our Facebook page that is always there. So, thank you very much and have a nice and fruitful meeting. I was always fond of this secluded hill and this hedge, which hides from my view so large a portion of the farthest horizon. But sitting and musing here, I picture to myself interminable spaces beyond the hedge, 
silences beyond the human grasp, and stillness so profound that my heart is almost frightened. But the moment I hear the wind rustle through these leaves, I compare that sound with infinite silence. And I call to mind the eternal, the dead seasons, and the present alive, with all its turmoil. In such immensity, my thought is drowned, and it's pleasant to be shipwrecked in the sea. This powerful text, which we all know and still do not know perfectly, um, comes to my mind and uh, drew my attention because I work with poetry and uh, on the occasion of the uh, celebrations for the 200 years since it was written. So I wondered, it is worth to have a look at it once again. I took several notes, but I will comment this uh, text without reading what I've prepared, and I will publish a book on this text next year. But I believe it is a case to uh, think about this uh, wonderful uh, poem for two reasons mainly. The first one, as Professor Ciambotti said earlier, is that this is a text which uh, mysteriously talks to everybody. It talks to everybody because it refers to something which um, is connected to anybody of us. When Leopardi thought about the problem of the infinite in the life of man, he uses a very strong sentence. He says that where he finds pleasure, the, um, the soul um, hates the fact that something is finite. The problem of the infinite is not um, something you think about because you have profound thoughts, but simply because your soul hates that, for instance, uh, uh, under the bridge which uh, collapsed uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, an entire family um, died. And pleasure is not simply uh, linked to what you eat or to sweets. The pleasure is something which um, uh, which uh, is uh, positive and favorable for the soul. When this ends, man uh, abhors. If we didn't have a problem of um, uh, of uh, the um, infinite, we would not abhor. We would simply accept the end. Something has happened, we would accept it. But something in you uh, finds this end repulsive, abhors it. We have this problem of the infinite. This is not a problem which uh, comes at the end of a series of reflections. It comes alive during the experience. And while you're experiencing something, uh, according to Leopardi's words, uh, this is a problem of the pleasure and the, um, and the pain. So life contains pleasures and lack of pleasure. When something finishes and uh, the soul liked it, well, the soul feels sorrow, feels regret. So the problem of the infinite does not come at a certain point uh, of your experience. It is part of the beginning of any experience, either the experience of seeing something beautiful or um, being with a pleasant person or uh, eating something uh, that you like. It is in the beginning of the experience, of any experience. And this is true. If you think about it, if you think about it, Leopardi, when he wrote The uh, Infinite, he was only 20 years old. And he's been 20 years old at those times, uh, meant to be almost to be an adult. But yet he was a young man. He was not so experienced. And the, um, the student, uh, Massimo mentioned, uh, is not a philosopher. This is the reason why coming to terms with a text of infinite does not mean uh, coming to terms uh, with uh, poetry. Uh, it, is, um, it means coming to terms with, the, with the, a specific element of our own lives, of our own experiences. 
We need to remember that our identity is linked to the infinite, and this is even more urgent today than it was uh, 50 years ago when uh, Father Giustani started to scream these things, uh, either the ego, either uh, I am linked to the infinite or I am linked to the power. So uh, I, what am I? This is what Lopardi wondered. Either this is linked to something which is infinite or your identity, and there's a lot of debate about this. Many people talk about gender, by, about identity. Either your identity is ultimately um, defined by, some, by your relationship with something which is infinite, or it is linked in some way with something which has to do with power. And power can take many forms, as we know. I'm not referring to the power of governments or politicians. Often the power is entirely different, totally different. The, the crawling power uh, for which you decided you will belong to something just because it is convenient for you. And this gives rise to the worst uh, slavery form. You are a slave and you do not even uh, realize it. Um, it is linked to uh, the fact of uh, um, um, to, to the fact that you cover your back. So being linked to the infinite needs to be um, at the core of our attention, especially in our current uh, era, especially if we consider we are living in, in a period in which anxiety dominates, uh, as Holden said. This is the period of the anxiety. Many, many people uh, take uh, um, anxiety, um, pills for, the, for anxiety, and anxiety is linked to what you manage to uh, accomplish or uh, it is linked to what you think. When you, have, when you are successful, everything is all perfectly okay, but as soon as you make one small mistake, you become your mistake. This is we uh, are experiencing, experiencing such a high level of anxiety. Your identity and the content of the word I, ego, coincides with what you do or with your or with your actions or with your sexual preferences. So the fact of having the identity of a person coinciding with the action is not um, does not lead to freedom. It leads to anxiety. Because as soon as we consider positive things, everything goes okay. But as soon as you uh, do something wrong, you become your own wrongdoing. You become your mistake. And here, uh, in this case, this leads to anxiety. It is very, very difficult today to debate or to discuss with somebody because each time you uh, discuss with somebody, uh, this person will tell, will tell you, you are questioning, you are um, questioning my identity. Oh, no, I'm just... Um, arguing or questioning your jacket because I don't like it. Debate today is always linked to anxiety. So uh, dealing with the infinite and thinking about the problem, which is uh, connected to the infinite, has to do a lot with the period we are experiencing, with the era we are living in. Each time I read it, I always um, listen to people breathing again as soon as they listen to the infinite, remembering that we are all made for the infinite and that our identity is linked to the infinite is something which leads to liberation. If you don't have somebody reminding you, you will simply suffocate in anxiety or in the many forms of power. So I was always fond of this secluded hill. I, I've always been impressed by the fact. Hi. How can you, when you are 20, uh, use the word always? You're only 20. It's, it's always, it has always impressed me. Poems. Poems can have a million different beginnings. Yet Leopardi decided to start this poem like this. I was always fond of, my, of this secluded hill. He could have started it in a million different ways, but he decided to begin by, I was always fond of this secluded hill. I, I wondered, why did he decide to use the word always? I was always fond in the past. Sempre caro mi fu in Italian. Why did this boy decide to use always, the word always. From a literary point of view, 
we can simply uh, state uh, uh, and and all the poets know this very well. I know there are many uh, there are many people writing po uh, poems. Uh, you have the temptation to to say this sky, this road, this sea, and the reader will simply question which which sea are you talking about? This sea is for you, but I'm living in another area. So if you write this, this is something which is linked to the place you are living in. So th the reader does not know which road you're, uh, you're making reference to. This is why Leopardi, this is my personal uh, interpretation, he, this is why he creates, uh, I, oh, I was always fond of this secluded hill. In this case, uh, these hills are within uh, a dimension which is uh, full of, um, of love, of, of affection. And you can imagine that this boy used to go, that Leopardi when he was young, he used to go uh, very often to that hill. So this is plausible in this case, even from a literary point of view when it comes to the art of poetry. But it is always a, uh, a guy, a boy, writing always. So the sense of time, and I will leave it here, I will come back later on. I was always fond of this secluded hill and this hedge which hides from my view this is repeated twice in two lines, in two verses. So a, a teacher would underline in red the fact that Leopardi repeated this two times in just two lines. So it would be a repetition, but in poetry you can uh, do everything if, uh, if it functions. So this and, and that there is another famous quill that quel ramo del lago di Como, the beginning, the incipit of the um, Promessi Sposi by uh, Alessandro Manzoni, which begins with uh, with the word quill, that. So experts in philology know that in the first draft, uh, which was not in uh, in poetry. Uh, and it was drafted by Leopardi, the first um, draft of this poem. Uh, Leopardi took a note uh, which uh, read, um, the speaker is quoting from, uh, from the notes by Leopardi. Uh, the first word was uh, uh, bramble. Um, And from the bramble, uh, Leopardi, uh, in the end, uh, chose the word hedge. Uh, Ungaretti uh, said that there was a quite of a um, certain degree of irony. Ungaretti is always right, but in this case, he's right because he understood that there is a certain a strange, weird degree of irony. Uh, irony is the um, shifting of discourse. So he has started from the uh, from another word from the word uh, bramble. We know that bramble is a word coming from the Bible. And we, knew, we know that uh, Leopardi has translated a psalm in seven different languages. Uh, this is never uh, studied at school. Uh, but Leopardi used to say, the Bible is the book of my uh, youth. And so in, the, in this verse, uh, which hides from my view so large a portion of the farthest horizon. But do, do we know the farthest horizon? But horizon is by definition the last one, the farthest. So you are, you are loading this word with uh, something, um, with some elements. You will find all these elements in my essay next year. So there is uh, this invitation. Leopardi uh, said that you should use words which uh, suggest the indefinite. So saying the farthest horizon means not only the horizon, but the, the very last horizon. So you, you keep going beyond. 
those of you who have been uh, to Recanati and you've uh, had a chance to see the precise place where um, um, where this uh, poem was written, uh, you would probably be deceived yet. But sitting and musing here uh, at the end of the verse, we uh, you find the word interminable. Interminable. When you look at a poem, uh, is uh, you are really, really looking at a dancer. So you have interminable. The word interminable, which in Italian is at the end of the verse. So interminable spaces beyond the hedge. So you're you're looking, you're observing. But sitting and musing here, and one would say, why are you sitting and musing? And observing if you have a hedge you don't sit you should try and move to look beyond the hedge sitting and musing here so I am in the position of um, of the thinker by Rodin uh, if you can remember the famous sculpture by Rodin um, and the origin is uh, that of the thinking Christ so the fact of being seated, of sitting, and Professor Giovanola wrote a beautiful essay on this. So this positioning of the of the body, being seated, the meditative, the man meditating is usually sitting. So I sit and I muse. The body also has to do with the reflection. The body has to do uh, with poetry. This is why I always like to repeat that computers will never uh, be artists because they don't have a body, not because they don't have the intelligence. They are intelligent, maybe more than men, but they don't have the body of man. And we are both a soul and a body, the mind and the body. This is not the case for the computers. Computer is only, only has a super mind, but no body. And so computers will never be able to create art. Body counsel, um, body matters and counts a lot when it comes to creating arts. So interminable, interminable spaces beyond the hedge, silences beyond the human grasp. What is a silence beyond the human grasp? I wondered, when have I ever heard a silence which goes beyond the human grasp? I thought about it. This is an exercise of reading you, all, you should all do. What do we mean by silences beyond the human grasp? Have you ever, have you ever heard a silence beyond the human grasp? Or you may think about the sea or, uh, or the mountains. Well, I remember distinctively when I heard a silence beyond the human grasp on a bridge in Lima, the capital of Peru, at 3 a.m. The bridge is always crowded because Lima is a very big uh, capital. Uh, it is always very crowded. While I was walking on that bridge, there was no silence. But at a certain point, at 3 a.m., I had just uh, I was coming back from a conference. I I saw three uh, children approaching, aged between three and four. They were walking alone in the chaotic roads of Lima. While I was watching them, I felt a silence beyond the human grasp. Silence is not simply um, something which is external, the lack of sounds. Silence is something which happens to you and which goes beyond human. You're experiencing something which is uh, beyond, above human experiences and still not so profound that my heart is almost frightened. So I, uh, when, when Lopardi says, mi fingo, it means I imagine. I'm not pretending, I'm imagining. So I create images. So Lopardi is, a, is telling us that man has no possibility to, as Lopardi said, not only the cognitive, uh, capability or the capability to love, but not even the imaginative ability is able to conceive, but only infinite. 
but only the indefinite. Solo party says we don't have any faculty, any ability that of loving, that of imagining, that of uh, um, knowing things. We have no chance to imagine infinite. I try and imagine the infinite. I try and create an image of the infinite, of the silences beyond the human grasp, of the very last horizon. I try and create an image of all this. And my heart is almost frightened. He's almost quoting a sentence by Pascal. Yet he was taking inspiration from important thinkers. So the heart of a person almost gets frightened. It is more than getting frightened. So the heart is almost frightened. Is the heart frightened or not? It is about to be frightened, but not yet. So if I'm making this effort to imagine, uh, I feel that I am on the verge of fright. I'm on the verge of fear, but not yet there. I'm, I'm still not frightened, but almost frightened. So with these adverbs, uh, Leopardi makes us uh, feel the, um, that we are all on the verge of being frightened. And so man uh, almost confounds himself with the, uh, with the nothing. And at the same time, you feel the, uh, the fear and the fact that you are on the verge of being frightened. So you can feel both sides of the coin. Man feels both sides, the nothing and the uh, infinite, the finite and the infinite. And this is what uh, poetry uh, needs to, uh, to lead you. So you both feel the almost and the null and the void. This is where poetry needs to lead you, at, to the border, to the edge. And my, my heart is almost frightened. Yeah. So we are at about half way of the poem, and we're now going to listen to Maestro Dorezetti once again.
La presenza della musica. So, the presence of music is not by chance. Bach is never by chance. Bach is a god. Without Bach, we wouldn't have Tiziano Ferro or Vasco Rossi. And actually, mus musicians are well aware of this. I'm saying this because art, the whole art, is made of measurement and form and musicians are always the most boring uh, uh, artists because they have a mathematical mind they are very they, they have the same defects of math teachers and that is because art is made of measurements and this reaches its peak in music I'm saying this because we are talking about the infinite, starting from a work of art, which is, so to say, the place, the venue of measurement. Ungaretti, the poet Ungaretti, used to say that poetry is a mystery and at the same time measurement. And he said, actually, not the measurement of mystery, because you can have the measurement of mystery, but rather something that appear, apparently is opposed to mystery and yet expresses mystery. This is what art is all about. It's ma art is made of measurement, so apparently it's against the mystery of the infinite, and yet it expresses this mystery. I'm quoting Ungaretti because one of the problems, uh, one of the problems uh, we have is that for the Greek, the peiron, uh, Aristotle, is limited. And this was a negative idea, a negative conception for the Greek culture and for us alone, this fear that we were talking about before. What's limited is very bad, it is ugly. And as a matter of fact, that corresponds, to, for example, to the ocean in, in Greek. Those who would go to sea uh, was a mad person. So facing what doesn't have any shape means going towards the chaotic. And so the word infinite, so the translation of a pyron, which in fact means uh, unlimited, may lead to chaos. So the infinite is the chaos. Is the infinite a chaos? Is the infinite to be paralleled to what has no shape or no measurement? This is an open question. There is a, uh, is a book by Zurlini on the measurement of the infinite. And in this book he shows that mathematics that has dealt so much on this issue. Uh, so many people have thought about that, Floreschi, Simone Weil. I mean, many philosophers and mathematicians have talked, have reasoned about the current infinite. And there will be a conversation with Bersonelli in Milan on these issues. In other words, science has to deal with measurement. And so basically they wondered what the infinite is to them. You need to start from Aristotle and from the art because the art gives shape, gives form and expresses with the shape something that is a mystery, that is uh, infinite and that has no precise form. There was a genius poet, Raina Maria Rilke, who translated the infinite, he tried to uh, translate into German the word, the poem infinite, and he noticed that in German the word was more similar to la paeron, so unlimited, and that that would have had uh, a negative connotation. So even if uh, he uh, was translated into German, he left the Italian title, l'infinito, probably because there's a difference, because the experiencing the unlimited and experiencing the infinite. The uh, limited appears to uh, the uh, world of mathematics. Uh, so that has a negative con connotation unless it is transformed into modern theology or archaic uh, mathematics. While the infinite is something different, it is not the numberless. Uh, the infinite is something different. Rilke understood that. Borges. Another genius said that the concept of the infinite corrodes all other concepts because when you have to deal with the infinite, you then question a lot of other things. This is, uh, also appears existentially. If you're visited by the infinite, lots of things enter a crisis. Lots of uh, cliches change. So having to deal with the infinite 
means that you have uh, to embark on a different pathway that may lead you to other languages like music or mathematics. Uh, but then eventually, and this leads me back to poetry, uh, man is made of words. And so even the experiences that we make with other languages ultimately lead us back to words. So man is, n is not aware of the world uh, if uh, uh, only with the uh, uh, words. And that is why Zuckerberg and other people made a lot of money with words because they understood that man is made of words. So if you give them a, a, a tool to exchange words, they become rich of that, out of that. Our experience is made of words. Our experience reaches our conscience through the words we use. Um, I have uh, an example, as an example I always do. You can say that a uh, Tia expresses more than many words, but you have to say it. You have to go back to words to express that, uh, and possibly to say the, to use the most adequate words uh, to uh, express an experience which sometimes is uh, speechless. Uh, when the, the the bridge fell in Genoa the other uh, day, I sent a poem. There are certain moments in which you are speechless and you need to take the word because men are made for words and this is something that poets uh, have always done. Ungaretti, for example, from the trenches and war or other poems uh, during persecutions. Uh, only tragedies help, uh, as Simone Weil said, and not men before tragedies. Apparently tragedies uh, uh, basically do not tell anything and so men have to talk. They have to use words. So the issue of the infinite in many directions, uh, the issue of the infinite towards other disciplines like mathematics uh, highlights the problem of human language. I'm just uh, touching upon this fact. So the infinite appears to, um, in a way, question um, everything that has a shape. So how can you express something that cannot be conceptualized, that has no shape? What kind of words, which words can you use? What words will you use? So having to deal with the infinite invites you to be in a place which is uh, always to be found in poetry. You cannot be elsewhere other than in poetry to deal with the infinite. And here, I'm not talking about a literary genre. I'm talking about poetry as the level of intensity of a language. You cannot be elsewhere than poetry to talk about the infinite and the link between human experience and the infinite. And as a matter of fact, the Greek in philosophy and not in poetry, are not capable of positively managing the concept of a parent because that is always connect negatively connotated. While when we say infinite, we uh, tendentially say something positive. That's not, that's not something negative per se. There is a, a, a passage which uh, is something that this poem invites us to think about. So my heart is almost frightened. These idols, these idols are defined by Leopardi as historical adventures of his soul. So the historical adventures of my soul, says Leopardi. And actually, this poem is read out as a moment of ecstasy, a Zen moment as if Leopardi had become a Buddhist, but it was quite difficult in Recanati in the 19th century. So Leopardi probably discovered this ecstasy, this infinite, but actually he used other words. He said historical adventures. And so I always wondered, what does in this poem happen? What happens in this poem? Why does this man use the words, my heart is almost frightened, and actually sort of hints to the possibility of being frightened? That's not, uh, it's something different saying, for example, my heart is almost frightened or it's pleasant to be shipwrecked in the sea. These are two different experiences. So this is my personal interpretation. And actually there's this book with all the interpretation on the e e infinite. And actually I didn't find the most authoritative one on this, but I, um, I had the chance of reading some interesting ones. Something happened on that hill, and uh, and something something happened here in the middle of the uh, 
um, poem. Uh, at the moment I hear the wind rustle through these leaves. I compare that sound with infinite silence. So something is happening and it's happening here, exactly in this moment. So the wind comes up to a moment in which Leopardi comes out from fiction. But he compares, he starts comparing, which means knowing. Man knows through comparison and he compares that sound with infinite silence. And he does that by imagination, through imagination. He has no direct experience of that. He can test it. He can try to imagine that uh, silence uh, beyond the human grasp. Between that kind of silence, going beyond the human grasp and that sound, he makes a comparison. You can actually make a lot of assumptions or speculations on this, but that's uh, not relevant. Leopardi uh, read the Bible. The wind uh, actually is one of the emblems that is normally used to, 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 to refer to the voice of God in uh, the book of uh, the, the kings. And actually, one should uh, uh, refer to a voice that uh, talks about the silence beyond going human, the grasp. But what kind of silence is a, uh, is a silence that speaks, that has a sound? But apart from that, I mean, maybe Leopardi had heard the voice of his mother, or maybe the voice of someone else. We should actually only think about ourselves and not about uh, the poets. We should forget the biographies of poets because uh, they, uh, that's not interesting. A uh, Silvia, and actually Silvia, which is the title of another poem by Leopardi, was actually Teresa. So this means that Leopard doesn't want us to know his things, his life. You shouldn't study the biographies of poets. You should read their works and think of yourself. So you have to think about your own problem. What is it for you, a silence that has a voice? And what do you compare? How can you compare a wind going through, rustling through the leaves? That can be, for example, the... Uh, that's, a, that's a sign is, that can be the sign of the voice of God or the voice of your mother. In any sign, the wind rustling through the leaves is a sign, and this in any, in any culture. So this man, at a given point, starts thinking, starts pretending, but he starts comparing that mysterious and possible object with a sign. And the sign introduces him to the possibility of uh, knowledge as a sign. We are a civilization that is uh, gradually losing the culture of science. There are lots of small signs, small symbols, uh, which are immediately effective. You click on that and something happens. But that's not a sign. That's simply an effective symbol, small symbol. A sign is something different. It is dramatic in its interpretation. Maybe habits uh, uh, can make it more calm. For example, if you have... Uh, 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 animals, for example, G's uh, going towards the highest steps in a poultry, that means that a flood is about to come. Experience makes certain signs more normal, help us interpret those signs. But if you get out of a culture of the sign, you're less disoriented. Signs are kind of strange, and they're almost, almost always not interpreted, because we are afraid of signs. We want small, effective symbols Signs introduce a different type of dynamics, which is liberty, freedom. So in my opinion, this is exactly like the wind. So as soon as the wind, at the moment I hear the wind rustle through the slaves, in that exact moment, after the I compare, um, I call to mind the eternal, the dead seasons, and the present alive with all its turmoil. So the present has a sound that is different from the sound of the past. Philologists actually think about the word sovviene in Italian, which was translated with I call to mind. It's not like I remember, it's I call to mind. And it is calling to mind 
There is an essay by a dear friend of mine who started in this, and, and she said, she stated, but actually, if you call something to mind that is brought to your consciousness, that comes to your consciousness, that is basically, uh, it is time. It is time that is called to your mind. And time is the way that man has found to be in the world. And what is time? That's a big mystery. That has always been a big mystery since St. Augustine. And that's an invention of ours. Time is an invention of ours because there's no time. Or at least it exists as the way that men have developed to be in the world. Maybe they, they, they have lots of time references before Christ uh, or uh, AD. Uh, so that is why time has a big mystery of mankind. And that's something that man has always uh, uh, speaks about that. And art is made of time, of rhythm, of measurement. And Le Padre here says, I call to mind the eternal. And then a, a strange succession, maybe illogical, an illogical succession. You have first the eternal. Then you have the dead seasons, and then you have the present. All of this comes all together. The mystery of time calls to mind all together. Of course, poetry cannot be translated. You write poems because you you cannot have other uh, words. You cannot be uh, elsewhere other than poetry. That's a strange contradiction. So the eternal and the present together. And that is why Le Pardi says, in such, such immensity, my thought is drowned. So something happened here. In such immensity. In the original, you uh, had a different wording in Italian. In questa immensità, de, non in questa immensità. So they, the Le Pardi used immensità de instead of uh, immensità immensity, but the, f the word initially used uh, is uh, a more ancient use of the Italian immensity. So basically, Leopardi did not publish, probably know this, publish uh, this poem during the, in the chants. Uh, he published it only in the second version of the chants. Poems are uh, sometimes never the best critiques of themselves. So he understood that that poem had something great, uh, magnificent inside. So he he eliminated immensità, de, the ancient word, and added immensità. And then said, in such immensity, immensità, my thought is drowned. And it's pleasant to be shipwrecked in this sea. So immensity at the beginning. and. And some things uh, actually come back in terms of experience, in terms of, of events that have happened. So the problem of the infinite, Lopardi has um, told us that actually he has made experience of the infinite. So the, um, the, so to say, elimination of the I, but actually, no, that was not true. The I, the self, is there. The self is there, otherwise Leopardi could have not said it's pleasant to be shipwrecked in this sea. The translation, uh, the translation into English says it is present. In Italian, we, we say il naufragar me dolce. So there's a clear reference to the I, to the self in Italian. The I, the self, is, is conscience. But that's not uh, an elimination or uh, a nullification, which is a nirvana style. But it is rather a contradictory kind of experience, which is possible only within poetry or in a field of human experience which is not immediately accessible. That's a contradiction. So um, pleasant shipwreck. For someone who actually writes poem, the word shipwreck is not easy at all. It's not sweet at all. It's not pleasant at all. Uh, that has to deal with a long tradition of poetry. Um, there's a nice volume. Uh, by Blumenberg on shipwrecks in literature. The idea of a shipwreck is really recurring in, in literature. The shipwreck 
meant being absorbed by the cows. Uh, the cows represented by the seer, by the apeiro, by the unlimited, the cows represented by passions, so wise men uh, are on the bank of the sea and actually they uh, are uh, safe on the bank, on the river bank or on the seashore and they look at the others uh, being shipwrecked. So you have, this, you have this spectator looking at himself uh, going, doing a shipwreck, a shipwreck in something which is no longer an, a shapeless cow. Or even if it is a shapeless cow, it is indeed something that makes him uh, uh, experiencing, making an experience which is really present. This is what Leopardi reaches. I'm not going to dwell too much on this because probably one could talk about this infinitely. But uh, there's one thing I'd like to point out that Ungaretti pointed out, uh, which is the fact that at a given point, uh, he says, that Leopardi liked to read Pascal, the great philosopher theorizing uh, risk. And at a given point, Leopardi, and these are the words by Ungaretti, quoting Leopardi, quoting in turn Pascal. So Leopardi, and I quote Ungaretti, says that the French philosopher whose genius had rapidly consumed the body, his mental abilities, the very same genius. As was happening to Leopardi, this was the addition, the integration by Ungaretti. The genius had uh, actually almost uh, exalted the self. Actually, writing the infinite costs a lot. Doing art costs a lot because you do art with uh, your uh, entire self and there's nothing more that you do with your entire self so doing art costs a lot is really uh, a big effort from a vital point of view that is why there was a guy yesterday Matteo 15 year old he writes poems and said I feel at a level that the others do not understand and actually, my reply was, uh, do not expect the others from, uh, uh, to understand what's the cost for you. Just do it and uh, actually uh, offer this uh, work of yours. But Leopardi basically said that the genius of Pascal was almost consuming him. And then Leopardi concludes by saying, uh, uh, by almost becoming mad, uh, referring to Pascal, uh, who had entered certain uh, mysteries of nature that are very difficult uh, to express. They are there, but they are very difficult to express. And Leopardi said, this genius has almost become crazy because of the strength of his uh, imagination. Almost crazy due to the strength of his imagination. So, Actually, do you, can, do you think that actually this text is written by a crazy person? I mean, we're talking about a hedge or a sound. Was this person a crazy person? Well, crazy in terms of imagination. Ungaretti actually pointed out and I quote Leopardi would talk about the uh, indefinite and actually, dear Giacomo, that's a word of, that's wordplay. You, you're doing, you're saying that just to, to hide yourself. What's the difference between the indefinite and the infinite? The indefinite is simply something that you attribute to the subject that is unable to define entirely what he's talking about. But the experience of uh, actually a field is almost the same because basically there's no big difference between exp between. Uh, um, infinite and indefinite and then in order just to hide yourself you call it indefinite and he said actually you are accusing Pascal you're saying that Pascal was crazy was he crazy or are you crazy as well in thinking that that you may have uh, 
an experience of knowing the infinite in places that cannot be but elsewhere but in poetry. That's not an ecstatic knowledge, but that's a sign, as we've seen. That's a, a comparison. So that is why it is profoundly human and also profoundly strange, profoundly odd, so to say. Because you, you need to have a sign. You need a sign. Maybe a simple sign like the wind or the smile of a person or friendship. These are not complicated uh, things. The wind through the leaves, uh, bustling through the leaves is not complicated, but it is your comparison that makes it like that, that actually it's your comparison. Uh, it's through your comparison that you decide that your thought is drowned and that you yourself can shipwreck and be shipwrecked. All of us, uh, sooner or later, are shipwrecked. You need only to decide how, maybe by, uh, maybe sweetly or by agitating yourself. And actually, Leopardi introduces this very important element here, the sign of comparison. So the infinite is something that you can know, that you can poetically learn and know, which doesn't mean that it does not exist. And as a matter of fact, Lopardi used to say that uh, Homerus and the ancient poets are fortunate because they can talk about the human experience in natural, in natural way, exactly as it is. And yet, we, we, we did the opposite. We complicated everything. And in a very beautiful passage, in a sentence on, Im on uh, imagination, Actually, I read Zibaldone four times, and he said a number of things on this poem, this idea of imagining. Leopardi used a very beautiful sentence. He said that man imagines. I mean, at the beginning, he was like a child, Homerus. So he imagines what is there, what's natural. It, there's no, there are no feelings. It's not sentimental, exactly as nature has shows it. And actually, he uh, would like, he loves so much the ancient points. And then he says, we imagine now as well. We also now try and imagine the infinite. Our heart has not changed. It's only the mind that has changed, not the heart. So that's why we are no longer capable of looking at reality, at the signs, at the infinite. But we need to regain this thing, which yet for Homerus, for the ancient, was natural. That was natural for them. So to come to a close, and before leaving the floor to the art, to music, I would like to read out a couple of uh, short things, a piece of poetry by a poem whom I like very much. Uh, only few geniuses uh, uh, lived in uh, the 19th century, Charles Baudelaire and Arthur Rimbaud. I'm going uh, first Baudelaire and then Rimbaud uh, in time. Uh, Le Fleur du Mal were written 20 years after Leopardi, and he had written Leopardi. And as a matter of fact, and rightly, Baudelaire, in a beautiful text uh, by him, he talks about trouble and says that we cuddle in our, our infinite in finite seas. So man is constantly made in his trouble, in his journeys, uh, by this desire of cuddling. He uses the image of a woman cuddling a baby. So we cuddle our infinite in finite seas. So this image has always struck me because it is exactly as you have a, a child in your arms. You have your own nature in your arms. So even very bad, uh, angry people like me, when you have a baby in your arms, you see, you become tender. And, and that is because you are cuddling your nature, your infinite nature in finite seas. And Rimbaud, who was a disciple, the most extreme disciple of Baudelaire, said, 
and uh, the poet uh, is uh, pronouncing uh, verses from Rimbaud translated into Italian. Uh, these verses are about eternity, going away with the sea. There was a passage in the infinite. In the first part, he actually uh, pretends to imagine. And the glimpse, the look, if you open your eyes, uh, you immediately uh, look at the world. We are in, a, in an immediate perspective, but not the sound, not your hearing. It's the hearing that basically uh, gives you signs. If you hear bells, uh, for example, you can remember your grandmother. If you hear a song, you enter a different time perspective, a different time dimensions. And as a matter of fact, it is the voice among the leaves. So there is this passage between saying and hearing. And that's the passage between, uh, between the musing and the hearing. And that's basically listening to sign that introduces to an experience of time, because the infinite has to deal with time. The eternal, and I'm going back to Rambaud, is the nature of time. Actually, I remember the nature of uh, time, and in, it is in such intensity that my thought is drowned, and it's pleasant to be shipwrecked in the sea. So indeed, and I will conclude with this remark, that it is an invitation for you all to work on this text and to learn it to learn this text, to learn this poem by heart, uh, as my friend Judith uh, does with, uh, with dance, uh, dancing this text. It is not possible to um, depict the infinite, to portray the infinite, unless, uh, like uh, philosopher Sergio Givone said, getting inspiration from Niccolo Cusano, who lived in the 15th century, the only representation of the infinite, the only point in which we see the infinite is that thing which, not by chance, uh, is not invented by mathematics, uh, politicians, uh, uh, it is invented by artists. When the, um, uh, the, the perspective was created in the Italian paintings during the Renaissance, Uh, you have uh, you have the vanishing point uh, in uh, in the paintings. You will never grasp that point. You can see it, but you will never be able to say, um, "I've touched it. I've grasped it." It is seeing without being able to possess. It is uh, something which is looming. It, you know it, but you will never be able to possess it. As Father Giuseppe said, the infinite is the vanishing point of reality. So the, when you look at things, where is the vanishing point? Ordering them, arranging them. Uh, is it you? Is it uh, this bottle? Is it power? It is the infinite vanishing point which makes re uh, reality real. You can really know it. This is what happens, that this weird vanishing point of the infinite can never be grasped, can never be described. It, can, it enters our experience. The vanishing point is also one of our experiences. Even if you don't grasp it, if you, even if you cannot touch it and you can never reach it, it is part of your experience. If you didn't have the vanishing point, you wouldn't have no experience of the world or your experience would be um, not the real experience. And so the vanishing point from reality uh, is uh, given by uh, Leopardi. It is an awareness. So he gains awareness totally of the sense of time. So the vanishing point refers to um, space and time. What is the vanishing point of your ears? What is the vanishing point of these days? 
Um, it, was it your mood, your state of mind? What is the vanishing point of your day? What you've done? The vanishing point of time and space is the infinite as an experience. You need to know it. Even though you cannot own it, you cannot possess it, but you must feel it. Otherwise, you run the risk of your experience not being visited by the infinite, by, by the apparent, uh, that which is chaotic, uh, um, limitless, and desert, void, and which does not generate anything. So thinking, uh, with, I would like to thank Michele Torresetti. Uh, uh, he plays violin at the, one of the orchestras of, in Munich. And I would like to thank Mr. Davide um, uh, Rondoni. And I would like to um, remind you that the meeting is uh, uh, totally for free, apart from what you eat, uh, all the exhibitions, uh, the sports, uh, the kids' village, the parkings, uh, the car parking places, uh, all the meetings, all the uh, sessions, all the encounters are all offered by the meeting. Do you know what, um, what makes this gratuitousness possible? The fact that the meeting is the result of the contribution of each and every one of us, the volunteers, uh, those who deal with the uh, exhibitions, the visitors, uh, uh, the artists, uh, um, everybody um, gives to the meeting something of him or herself. Uh, the energies, the time, the talent, uh, the abilities. This year, you can um, contribute to the building of the meeting through a donation. Uh, along the exhibition, uh, along the halls, you will find some desks where you can read Dona Ora, Donate Now. Uh, you have a magenta colored red, uh, color, red colored heart. Uh, the donations can only be given to the volunteers in these desks. they wearing a magenta colored t shirt. Uh, uh, are there also volunteers uh, um, moving uh, around? But the, it, it is an important uh, uh, take um, take home message. So please, the the t-shirts of these volunteers is a magenta, so a deep red, uh, sort of a dark red. That that's the magenta color. So if you find green t-shirt people wearing green t-shirts, please do not donate money to them. So thank you very much and uh, enjoy the rest of the evening.